Bartram's Boxes Remix is a collaboration between the Center for Art and Wood and Bartram's Garden, home of the celebrated 18th century explorer and botanist John Bartram and his family. John Bartram, who lived from 1699 to 1777, had a lifelong commitment to what he called the complete discovery of the native growth in America. His explorations resulted in the discovery and classification of many novel species of plants. His work was continued by his son, William. And Bartram's Garden, their home and workplace in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, became an international center for botanic discovery. In 1735, John began sending boxes containing seeds, plants, and curiosities that he had gathered on his travels to collectors and students of botany in England. The contents of these eagerly anticipated boxes introduced many new species that survive in Europe today and preserved some from extinction. Enlightened thinkers of the 18th century had a keen appreciation of science and an analytic approach to society. They used nature as an exemplar of human behavior and interactions. After a 2010 storm damaged the grounds of the garden, the Center for Art and Wood put out a call to artists to create works relating to Bartram's history, artworks that might incorporate wood from the 13 types of trees felled by the storm's high winds. For this show, jurors Leah Douglas director of exhibitions at Philadelphia International Airport, Joel Fry, curator of Bartram's Garden, and Mira Nakashima of Nakashima Woodworker, selected 36 works by 40 artists that celebrate the spirit of the Bartrams and their passion for the natural world. It wasn't your idea? It was not my idea. <laughs> Whose was, idea was it? Well, I must say. I'm Brad Whitman, an environmental lawyer and naturalist, and there was a very large storm here, which was similar to a tornado. I was downtown looking out my window, and I saw this storm, and I thought, what damage could there be? And as a wood turner, I thought, where would the wood be? So I came down the next day to Bartram's Gardens to look for what might be here, and it was quite devastated by the number of trees taken down. And the minute I saw the trees, I said, we have to do something about this, and got a hold of Albert Leekoff down at the Wood Turning Center. And I said, I think we ought to have a joint exhibit and uh, have some people turn this and talk about Bartram's Gardens and bring the two groups together. He said, fantastic, and took it from there. Are you happy with how everything turned out? It's absolutely magnificent. The kind of spiritual part of this, of two groups getting together, and finding interesting stories about Bartram himself and about the family and the wood is really wonderful. the artist looking at his bench. Are you going to tell those people to get off your art? No, that's what it's for. Oh, okay. That's why you called it a bench? That's why it's a bench. <laughs> My name is Mitch Ryerson. The bench is based on the idea of combining some of the natural forms from Bartram's with some of the architectural forms that John Bartram created when he was building his house. The columns that he had carved himself particularly intrigued me using a column and turning it on its side and lying it on the ground so that you could sit on it. It would look reminiscent of a fallen tree and then took a big log and used it as the back that you would lean against. So it's a place to sit and to think about the combination of nature and fabricated man-made objects. 
Is the wood from one of the felled trees? This wood is not. This wood is black locust, which is native to Kentucky, spread up to New England in the 18th century or so. It was brought up for use as fence posts and in shipbuilding because it's so rot resistant that it was a very popular wood in construction outdoors. That's why I used it as well. It lasts a really long time. My name is John Thornton, and for the past year I've been making films for Philadelphia's Center for Art in Wood. On Friday, May 2nd, 2014, the Center held an opening for the Bartram's Boxes Remix show. The next day, many of the artists and patrons met for a wonderful afternoon at Bartram's Garden in southwest Philadelphia. I got the chance to speak to many, but not all, of the artists whose work is on display. We have a couple of collaborators here, and I'm going to ask them about the collaborative process. The whole thing came about because Paige was invited to apply for the show, and she said, well, how about I talk to Bird about that? Paige gave me a call. I said that would be great because she lives in North Carolina and I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And we thought it would be a great way for us to hang out together from a distance. And we had collaborated a bit before at an event that happens in Canada. We knew we could have fun together anyway, <laughs> making stuff. But the parameters were really broad, so it took a while to refine it down to something that made sense to the two of us. So the alphabet is what we came up with. And who did what? We each took half of the alphabet. I did A, she did B. I did C, she did D. Well, I'm Gord Peteran, and uh, the piece I did for the exhibition is titled Blind Spot, which is in response to my visit to the Bartram Gardens and noticing the pending destruction of this lovely little piece of real estate from all directions. city to the north, like the city of Oz or something, looming and the real estate values escalating and the river and oil refineries to one way and the train track gash through the land and the other way and landscape graders tearing land up to the south to build new complex of homes and this lovely little quiet garden in, in the center. The piece is about vision and the lack of vision that uh, are always at odds with each other. It's made of some rose bushes that were salvaged. Maybe it's not one of the trees that came down, but it's influenced by the storm and threatened and damaged, just as the other things were. It goes on your head. There's something that sort of protects the head or the eyes, but also the barbs are quite threatening to your face and eyes as well. A little crown of thorns going on there too. Well, the crown of thorn reference is great iconography, a, a halo that is harmful. I'm Amy Forsyth, and I've collaborated with Katie Hudnall. She and I had met each other through the Furniture Society and also through the Emma Lake Collaborative. We decided to send each other seeds, which in our definition were little sculptures or little drawings that were supposed to inspire one another. And since we lived at a distance, we had to do it by mail, email, and Facebook to communicate. Katie was living in Murray, Kentucky at the time, and some of the things that she sent me were related to the rural atmosphere, things like barns and maps and other things that she had kind of invented. Mine came more out of my head, things that I saw that I imagined in different ways, and then she reinterpreted. I did a lot of drawing. Katie's an amazing draftsperson. All of her drawings are really beautiful, as well as her furniture pieces. Both of us did drawings and construction. I also bound a book that has the whole process from the beginning of our writing the proposal through to the construction of the piece itself.
I'm Chris Storb and I did a collaboration with Don Miller. Since we're both in the area, we wanted to do something very closely in collaboration with Bartram's Garden itself. So we looked through the entire property for a appropriate place to work and found a location in a addition to the house called the Conservatory. When we started, I think that we thought we were going to be making a few signature objects that we would fill with things collected on the grounds of the garden. We realized we didn't have that much time to do the collecting, and then we wanted to make things ourselves. So we began going back to our own spaces, making things. Sometimes we knew what the other person was making, sometimes we didn't, and then we'd meet at the garden and continue to install in our space. Our collaboration lasted more than a year as we continued to make things and show them to each other. Very enjoyable, and the staff was fabulous to work with. Hilary Pfeiffer, artist. Originally I wanted to make three walking sticks, but then I boiled it down to one that's based on William Bartram, the son of John Bartram's botanical illustrations, because I thought it would be interesting to make them three-dimensional. And it was a huge challenge to take a two-dimensional drawing and make it three. Even if I knew what the plant looked like, it was hard to find pictures on the internet or in bird books of birds with the same markings and I felt like I had to be loyal to the illustration. It was an interesting challenge. Where did you find the illustrations by John Bertram? There's some beautiful books done with his illustrations in them, so fortunately my library in Portland, Oregon had them. Hi there, John Santillari. I collaborated with my brother Paul, a very well-known local artist here in Philadelphia, on our piece Box Tree Tower and it's a crazy series of boxes and a triangle base using the wood from Bartram's. We've got spalted maple, which has a bit of disease in it, rainbow poplar, which has streaks and grain in it that's accentuated, in this case, not by a disease, but by minerals that grow through it, and then a species that's colloquially termed cucumber magnolia. And the inspiration really was the row homes of Philadelphia sort of mixed into the seed boxes of John Bartram, rethinking how those two might fit together. I'm the woodworker. My brother designed the insect glass, mimicking the flora and fauna of the seeds that were sent all over the world by Bartram. Each of the boxes has a different representation, whether it be plants or birds or animals. The boxes themselves were an amalgamation of sometimes smaller pieces, a mixture of species that we kind of smashed together in the same way that houses sit one next to another in Philadelphia. It was a lot of fun to collaborate with my brothers. This is our first collaboration. Very enjoyable. Leah Woods. What did you do? I did that. The piece I made is called In and Down and Up and Out. It's an interpretation of a map. And the map is about the flow of information that John Bartram collected with his son when he traveled up and down the East Coast. They gathered that information themselves. They also gathered dried flowers and plants and drawings from Native American slaves and women. They collected all that information and sent it over to London where the information was pulled together and published in books that were then sent back to Philadelphia as well as the world. The in and down and up and out is about the flow of information into Philadelphia, over to London, back to Philadelphia, and also simultaneously out into the world. So it's an experiential map more than a map of a geographic location. And the movement is this information. Hi, I'm Christina Cassone. And I'm Steve Moore, and we collaborated on this. I have a long 
long-term history with Albert in the wood turning field. I've been in almost every challenge show, and so I was really excited to submit a proposal for this one based on some of the quiet orbs that I've been doing. Rather than hollow turning, I just made solid forms. And then I struck on the idea of the field moving into new directions. And so I approached Christina about the possibility of collaborating and elaborating on this whole idea of growth and the male and the female. I'm a junior at IUP. Steve hired me as his collaborator because I had an introduction class with him and we had done a project similar to this and we thought that it would suit the show. The form I made is made out of basket reed and tissue paper. It came about as this development around Steve's form. I also developed the title Chloris and Flora. It's inspired by Greek and Roman mythology. It also has to deal with the colors and pale hues of the form that we made. It's really beautiful. You, you guys did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nathan Hansen. My piece, 131 Rings, presents the original growth rate of a tree that I got from Barcham's Garden in real time now. The motor that I have that's powering, it turns in one revolution per minute and goes through a uh, system of gear reduction all the way up to the top ring or the drawing surface, which turns in one revolution per year. So when you see the rings that are being drawn, really a giant spiral, and essentially drawing at the rate that tree grew. Its total capacity for time, or rings, is 131 years, just like the tree that I got from the garden. You better hope for no power outages, though. <laughs> yep, exactly. If it's plugged in you know, the whole time, with a little bit of maintenance, that's what it will do. How long has it been running? Uh, it's been running about a week right now, but uh, in order to get the idea across, I needed to put some rings on the top. So basically what I did was remove the belts from the motor and turn the top. So the machine actually drew the rings that are on it right now, and I put about 15 years on it. So it's got 15 years in a week right now. It's really, really cool. All right, thank you very much. You see a lot of big trees here. Most of them are less than a century old, but this very bedraggled tree could be as early as 1804, 188, something in that range. It's a tree from the Tennessee River Valley. French botanist called the Michauds found it and probably gave it to the Bartrams. And it's been ripped apart by storms about every 25 years. It regenerates. It's a very you know, forgiving tree. Another good tree is right behind us. You see the very large uh, tree with the 45 degree branches. That's the ginkgo, it's the male ginkgo. It may be the oldest ginkgo in North America. We think it was uh, planted in 1785. It really is a spectacular tree. I'd wow. love to see that tree when it's, when it's turning because it's just a giant gold thing. It's fabulous. Is ginkgo something that you can sculpt? I'm sure you could, sure. but it's, it's not uh, a commercial lumber. I know that there's certain medicinal qualities about ginkgo. Like what? I can't remember. Gingivitis, perhaps? <laughs> or, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Hi, I'm Neil Donovan, and I'm with John Vahanian, and we've been collaborating since roughly 1990. Our latest piece is called Precarious Crossing. Our goal was to try to show some of the energy that would have gone into the crossing of the Atlantic as Bartram's seeds and cuttings and so forth would have gone back and forth to Europe. We have a ship in distress in the piece. There's a grindstone on the piece. Our goal was to give some sense of the journey of the work without being too literal. I'm hoping we were successful. Neil's a wood turner. I'm a painter, sculptor. We're good friends and we just love the way we work together. It's invigorating, it's sensuous, it's a fabulous experience. I had a gallery years ago with my ex-wife and Neil came into the gallery while he was in school and said, you know, want to see what you guys do. We've made a connection, a great connection. I love the guy, so I said, maybe sometime we'll do something. And sure enough, we ended up doing a number of things. What do you think about the Center for Art and Wood? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. The Lakoff brothers are a gift to the guys like John and I that do this work. They launch careers. We couldn't have more respect or thanks for what they're doing here. My name is Fred Rose. I'm from Southern California near Costa Mesa. I'm interested in wood as a whole body of lore and ideas. I'm trying to show different connections between different ideas of what wood is, and its history, its folklore. Um, at the same time, I'm also trying to bring in contemporary elements to the design. With these pieces, what I did is I took one log, start with that as a base, and then off of that, I build an armature that takes different things that that particular species of wood is known for and try to bring poetic images of that. This piece is bitternet hickory. Hickory is used as charcoal, so there's this piece of charcoal here. It's used for tool handles. 
So there's the hammer handle here. The piece with the sassafras, we have the little root beer extract bottle because sassafras was root beer. Sassafras would be used for slack coopering, so it was used to make barrels and things of that nature. The hawthorn, I found out that the word haw means hedge. This top component is this hedge form with the thorns in it. A little blast furnace with a little iron pig on it with FE, which is a symbol for iron. Hawthorn burns so hot, you didn't need to add oxygen to melt iron. So that's why there's a little furnace there. You are essentially not only an artist, but a wood historian. My work is interested in all the little odd things that surround woodworking. Well, what did they use this wood for? And the joy of it for me is hunting down those little odd things. The artists in the show are from across the United States, as well as Canada and Europe. One artist is from Japan, and although I did not get to speak to him, Exhibitions Committee co-chair Robin Rice spoke about his work. It's too bad that John Bartram, the imagined recipient of Satoshi Fujinuma's box, can't see this amazing box. The precisely imagined seeds and seed pods produce a delight that must be like that a recipient of one of Bartram's crates would feel. Fujinuma originally called this work a chocolate box, perhaps because you never know what you're going to get. It's tied neatly with a bow. The three-layer container does look a little like a fancy box of chocolate. But the interior compartments also suggest a bento box or perhaps a box for storing and shipping porcelain or other precious art objects. Fujinuma's very rare seeds and seed heads from the Far East are fantastical but precise in form, almost believable. He even provides imaginary descriptive classifications for each one. It turns out that Satoshi is not the only artist in this show who likes to invent new plant species. My name is Zach Weber. My collaborator Ben Nettis and I have been working on a piece called Aphrodite's Mousetrap. Composed of various materials that we found at Bartram's Garden, combined with motors taken from electronic toys. Tickle Me Elmo, singing bass, that kind of thing. We took some of these motors, some of these computer chips, and we retrofitted them so that we are getting them to power fake carnivorous plants, which we've made up for the most part. Fantastic creatures that don't actually exist, but theoretically could exist. I'm Ben Neiditz. And the piece also is a reference to John Bartram's role in introducing the Venus flytrap to European science. Who did what? There are five distinct creatures inside the box, and we sort of had a little more ownership over each one, but aside from that, it was pretty thoroughly a collaborative process. We've been friends for a long time, and we seem to share a taste for things that are a little bit disturbing in certain ways. A little bit creepy, creepy and silly, which ended up being a pretty good fit, I think, for this project. Ray Jones. <laughs> Dixie Biggs. I collaborated on a piece with Dixie Biggs. I made a box with wooden hinged doors. I made my part and sent it away to her, and tonight's the first time I've actually seen the finished piece. She carved the ginkgo leaves for the poles, the leaves on the inner door, and all the little objects that go inside. I'm just amazed they look like the real thing. I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and Dixie lives in Gainesville, Florida. I would have thought you were the North Carolinian with that accent. <laughs> well, my parents are both from North Carolina, so I have the accent by default. <laughs> when the prospectus on the show came out, Ray emailed me and said, hey, you want to collaborate on a piece? And I said, sure, since I love Ray's boxes. Talked about what kind of box we wanted to do, and once we settled on a shape, he made the box, sent it to me, and then I had to come up with all the carving on it, which is kind of intimidating to carve over somebody's beautiful box to begin with.
We had come to the gardens prior to this, and I had picked up a bunch of the pods and seeds around the garden that I thought I was going to incorporate into the piece. Picked up a bunch of leaves from there, too, that I used as a pattern for my carved leaves. The box was made out of walnut and cherry and boxwood. And I actually used boxwood that was from Bartram's garden to carve all the seeds and pods out of. How do you artists from different parts of the country get to even know about each other? We met decades ago, I guess, at a craft show somewhere in Florida. And since then, over the years, we got to be friends. Hi, I'm Allie Crow. My work are silver bell carvings referencing plants but also the apothecarial nature of what they were doing at Bartram's, hence the bottles. I use a Stanley 99E utility knife for my carvings, only hand tools, so it's a labor of love. I can carve for up to 12 hours in a stretch without really noticing, so I don't clock my hours at all. I draw as I carve. I start with a general idea and then the more I carve away, I'll go back and make new drawings to refine the shape. To get the exterior curves of a piece, I'll set it on top of the drawings that I've done, just so I can get a visual idea of this is where I want to make this cut and this, and so I shape based off of that. One thing I noticed about this bottle is the edge looks very abraded. What's going on with that? I wanted it to look like the plant was struggling. All of the shipments that occurred were from the States to England, and a lot of plants didn't survive, but they wouldn't know that that was the case until months afterwards because it was done by ship. So I wanted it to seem like there was strain on the bottle, so I broke it. <laughs> You have a quite a striking tattoo that seems to relate to your art. Oh, I guess you could say that. I got interested in botanical illustration when I was in high school and went to college for illustration. So all of my tattoos are my own drawings. Ben Coker. This piece is Museum of the Maker's Hand, and there's two parts to it. One component is the Museum Annex, where I have displayed specimens, which are all offcuts from other artists in the show. So works, you know, as they were making their piece, these scraps and remnants and leftovers. And I was in communication with them and got them to send me little scraps, and then I put those on display in the one section. This little piece here is something that Jack Blairmore literally just chainsawed off the side of his piece when he was making his. And then the other section is a miniature gallery where those works that were tiny under most contexts become monumental because of the scale of the miniature gallery. And then the whole, both boxes collapse for transport as well. Where did you get trained? I've been working for Jack Laramore, who's another artist in the show, for the last three years or so. Recently just moved up to Philly, and so I'm bouncing around to different things now. But uh, he was a huge influence, and then also extremely grateful for all his advice along the way. Thanks a lot. It's really cool. Appreciate it. Because of its lyrical interplay between nature and art, this show could justly be described as visually poetic. But this final work is a collaboration that combines both visual poetry as well as the more traditional kind. I'm Beth Feldman Brandt. I'm a poet and I collaborated with Claire Owen, who's a visual artist. We created three boxes, hand-bound boxes that Claire made, one called Caretakers, one called Journeys, and one called Storms. Each of the three boxes is totally unique. I'm Claire Owen, and I've been making books for 35 years. The project appealed to me because my work has long been related to nature and as a source of inspiration, and I have been using boxes to develop book works and the idea of Bartram using these to send his work out. The whole thing just gelled for me. 
Beth and I had worked on another book together, and I respected her poetry a great deal, so she said she wanted to do some poems to go with the trees. When we were working on the poems, we had this schedule where I had to finish the poems in time for each book, in time for each box, and I was getting to the end, and I was on the deadline, and I had one poem left to do, and I realized I had never done a poem that was called Bartram's Boxes. So the last poem I wrote was this one. Bartram's Boxes. We travel at risk of health and untold loneliness to uncover what has been seen only by creek or crocodile among the brambles. How we love each fruit or flower for its singularity. The way we love a wife's touch, a son's quick mind, a daughter's attentiveness. Ours is the commerce of curiosity, seeds scattered, sifted, tenderly nestled in moss until with sunlight and breath each will spark like tinder, reveal its secret. Beauty, fragrance, usefulness, brilliant as sunset, dark as coffee, a bomb, sent to bloom across oceans, like the children who blossom in our absence. We are men of science, men of faith. This is our praise.